Jesus, we're so thankful to gather in your name today, God. Jesus, we need you so much right now. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for being our best comforter, our best friend. Thank you for never leaving our side, never giving up on us, never turning your back on us. Thank you, Father, for what you're gonna do today. I ask that you'll touch your people today, God. Lord, we didn't come here for another event. We came here to encounter you today, Jesus. So Lord, I ask that we will encounter you, God. Let none of us leave the same. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. You guys can sit down. Yeah, you can stay playing, that's great. So um, you guys have heard a little bit about my story and I'll go a little deeper about that today. You know, I was born in a Christian home. I told you the part about how I went to Columbia. When I went to Columbia, I got set free of unforgiveness, hatred. What I didn't say yesterday is I actually told my father one time, I hate God. And when I said that, he said, please don't say that. You don't know what you're saying. And I said, no, I really do. I hate God. I hate him for calling you. I hate that I was born into this family. I hate everything about it. I don't want anything to do with this. I really had no intention of ever serving God. I wanted to grow up and get out of my household and never look back. I was broken. I was confused. I was deeply misunderstood. I didn't trust anybody. I had walls so thick that I wouldn't let anybody get through them. I didn't let people hug me. I, I was completely lost. And so I went to Columbia when I hit rock bottom after getting kicked out of a Christian university. And I was really low. And I met this beautiful family, as I shared yesterday, Cesar Castellano, who took me in and loved me and I had hope. And that was the first time I had been in a Christian environment for a really long time because I stopped going to church altogether. I just didn't want to do any of it anymore. And so I was there and a lady spoke on unforgiveness. And I had so much unforgiveness and bitterness in my heart, so much that it, I felt heavy inside. And so I was so sick of feeling so heavy. So I ran down to the altar and I said, I wanna be free from unforgiveness. I can't live like this anymore. I wanna forgive. I wanna forgive everybody, even God. And Cesar Castellano's daughter came and laid her hands on me and just started to embrace me which already felt a little at first weird for me. And she started to hug me. And as she started to hug me, I just started to cry. And she prayed for me in Spanish. <laughs> I love Spanish now. So many things happened and yes. Oh man, I love the Hispanic community. They're so beautiful. She started praying for me in Spanish and I don't know what she said, but when she started to pray, I felt a heaviness lift off me. And I felt so free that I felt like I could fly out of the room, I really did. And I just started to forgive, just forgive people from my childhood, forgive my family for not being there like I thought they should have been at the time. They didn't know, they were doing the best they could. They just never did it before. I just started to forgive the Lord, started to forgive all the people that turned and turned their backs on us and betrayed us. Just there was so much inside that I, I never let go of. So I started to just let it all go. And I went home that night, well not home, but to the Castellanos house where I was staying. And for the first time in years, I opened my Bible again and said, oh God, I miss you. I miss you. I, I want you again. I used to love you so much as a little girl. I was really tenderhearted like I am now. Notice the crying. I was really tenderhearted as a little child. So much so my parents had to take me out of Bambi because I could not get it together. At Bambi, when the mom died, and I was wailing so loud and crying. My dad was like trying to cover my mouth. And um, he like, we left the movie because I was so just heartbroken over that mom dear. And I was so tender though, as a child, life wasn't complicated. Life was easy. I didn't see bad. I only saw good. And for the first time since I was a little girl, I started to feel tender again in my heart and started to talk to the Lord again. And he was so available and so there. And then the next day I went to a workshop session 
And the thing that always gets me is this is now really the heartbeat of our ministry, Jesus Image. There was a guy there and he talked about first love, coming back to your first love. And he said, don't you remember when you were little and you used to cry so easily? You would read the Bible and you'd cry. You'd hear a song, it moved your heart, you'd cry. And I just sat there crying. I said, oh God, I just want that again. I don't wanna look at life the way I look at life anymore. I wanna be tender again. I want Jesse back. I wanna be that little girl again. I wanna have a heart like that again. And he started to break me and I started to cry. So I went home, a completely different girl. I stopped, I was really bad, just I don't have to tell you all the things I did, just take my word for it. You wouldn't want your child to be me. I was really bad and I, I remember one night driving with my friend, I, I didn't tell my family this, I went to meet her at a nightclub and I sat in the parking lot and I tried to get out thinking, I won't do anything bad tonight. I, I'm not gonna live like that anymore. I can just go in and be around it, I'll be okay. And I could not open the door and I called my dad and I said, dad, I lied to you. I'm at a club right now trying to go in and I can't get out the door. And he said, just come home, baby, just come home. It's gonna be okay. And I went home and from that day forward, I never lived that life anymore. He took me to all of his crusades. I started traveling. I met Michael shortly after that and we started serving the Lord together. <laughs> I wish my story ended there, but it doesn't. This is where Bethel, comes in and this is what I believe in my heart today. I know you guys are here hungry for an encounter from the Lord, right? We're all hungry for God to touch us. See, if God doesn't touch us, we just go through life living day to day the same. And that's not what he wants for us. He wants us to be free and whole. He wants his children to not live a life of fear and anxiety and doubt and unforgiveness. That is not the life that he made for you. So I pray that as I share my story today, that God will encounter you even in your seats and you'll be set free today, that you'll have your moment like I had my moment here. Three years ago, I came here and God set me free. God set me free and I believe the only, I, I'm so thankful to be here because I believe with all my heart that God wants to set each and every one of you free today. Today's your moment. Do not leave this event without holding on to Jesus. He will set you free. Only Jesus can set you free. He's the only one that can set you free. But you have to grab it. You can't just sit there. You can't let him pass you by. You have to take him. You have to go after him with everything in your heart. So I met Michael. We had three kids. We got into ministry. Life got busy. I stopped praying. I stopped seeking the Lord. I stopped going to the services again. I just felt busy as a mom. I just wanted to be home. And I'm not saying that's bad. I love being a mom. The greatest calling in my life is being a mom. It really is. That to me is the most special thing. I'd rather do that than stand up here. It's just beautiful to be a mom and a wife. Um, but I just was lost in my own issues. My heart started to get hard again. I thought that I was free from that. But see, if you go back to living the same way, you might not be living in sin like I used to be in college, but my heart grew cold again to Jesus. I stopped going after him again. See, he gives us daily bread, right? You have to go after it every day. Even a week from being outside of Jesus, it changes you. You feel different. Even if I spend a few days without the Lord, I'm like, I don't feel like myself. I'm not tender like I used to be. I need Jesus. I'm so desperate for him. And you can say that's religion. No, that's Christianity. That's true love. That's a marriage. And we're married to Jesus. We're married to him. So I stopped going after him. Ministry was something when Michael started getting busy, it scared me a little bit. I thought that my kids would go through the things that we went through growing up. It was something that I didn't want to fully embrace. And so I became numb again inside and I stopped going after God. Well, little by little, it started to break me and all of life's problems started to weigh me down. See, in my family, I'm known as the strong one. I'm the one that figures everything out. I'm the one whenever there's an issue, they call Jess. I've always been strong. I found my identity in being a strong person. I actually found my identity in that more than Jesus. That was my role. So I can never crack, I can never lose it because if I did, then everything else would fall apart. So I was always that girl. So I started to feel weak, but I didn't talk about it to anybody because I didn't wanna look weak. 
I didn't wanna be vulnerable. I didn't wanna feel exposed. I didn't wanna tell people what was really going on inside. See, sometimes we can live like we have it all figured out and you can fake it to everybody else, but you can't fake it to yourself. You can't lie to yourself and you definitely can't lie to the Lord. You know what's going on inside. And I kept faking it and faking it and faking it. And finally, it just got to the point where I stopped sleeping at night. I didn't sleep for three years. When I say not sleeping, I don't mean like five hours. I mean like if I got two to three hours, that was a decent night for me. I had so much going on in my mind, so much always happening. I carried burdens of other people's issues that were not mine to carry. And I had it weighing on me so heavily that I couldn't sleep. And I remember I used to wake up at night and just say, Lord, please just let me sleep. Please let me sleep. I just want to sleep, please. And another part of my story, and I share it now publicly because my mom was so brave to go and talk about it on 700 Club years ago, but she got addicted to sleeping meds when I was a kid. And she got addicted to medication because she couldn't sleep because she grew up in ministry too and she just had the pressures of this world. So I was so, when I saw that happening, I thought, no God, you can't let this repeat itself. I, I didn't wanna ever do this. I didn't wanna have these issues. I saw what it did to my mom all those years not sleeping, what it did to her. I don't wanna get addicted to, to medication. I just, I don't want this. So I, when I started not sleeping, it deeply scared me. And then I started to feel anxious all the time. And something I dealt with since I was a little girl was severe fear. Not like a little fear, like severe fear, like not leaving the house, always afraid that something bad was gonna happen. I was always waiting for the next tragedy to happen because it felt like in life, there was so many highs and lows growing up that I, I always just felt I didn't deserve to be happy. I didn't feel like I deserved happiness and a happy life. So even if things were going good or even if there was people in my life that really did love me, I was always thinking that something bad was gonna happen or their motives weren't pure. So I, when I started not sleeping, I thought, oh no, I see the pattern going. But instead of running to Jesus, I ran away even more. And I shouldn't have done that, I knew better. And so I started not sleeping, my fear, intensified in a major way, severe fear. I didn't feel sane in my mind. I was anxious. I was self-destructing things. I was not a fun person to be married to. I wasn't being a great mom. I was completely falling apart. My whole life, I was ruining everything the Lord had, had, was doing. And Michael and my dad would have these talks and Michael and his amazing friends would have these talks and they would talk about Jesus and they would cry and they would do all these lockaways and have all these amazing encounters. And I would just sit there envious in my heart and I would say, that never happens for me. I don't, I don't talk about you, Lord, and cry. You don't move my heart like that anymore. Why not? But it's really simple. I wasn't putting in the time. They were putting in the time. They were making him number one and I wasn't. He was just an addition. He was just there. I had no deep relationship with him and that's why I was feeling so empty inside. So finally, one day I took my kids to the store, my younger two. If you know my younger two, you understand they're a handful. So I took my younger two to the store and it was just a stressful day. Michael was out and about and I started to feel really funny in my body. And so I came home all shaky, Michael shared yesterday, I had to wear a heart vest because my heart was physically being affected. Um, Dr. Crandall, who's an amazing doc, Dr. Crandall, right, Michael? Yeah, Dr. Crandall, he's an amazing doctor, Ryan Herbunke, uh, I have so many people go to get to him for a checkup and he said, something's really wrong, your heart's really messed up, it's skipping around, I need to put you on a life vest for a few weeks just to monitor your heart. So my fear was so severe and anxiety that it was physically affecting my body now. So I was laying down, because I, when I came home I felt all tingly inside, my chest was tight, my arm went numb, and Michael came home and I don't really even remember much, but I guess he was like slapping me on the face and he was like, Jess, snap out of it. And I said, you need to call 911. Something's really not right. I think I'm having a stroke and I'm not one to ever be an alarmist. So for me to say call 911, something was really going on in me. And so he called and they came and they were checking me out. 
and I heard one of the paramedics say to one of the other paramedics, they said, I think she's physically fine. I think this is a breakdown. This is anxiety. And to be honest with you in that moment, I would have rather them told me it was my heart or something was physically wrong because the shame of accepting that I was having a nervous breakdown was too much for me to bear because I used to think they weren't even real. And I would judge family members of mine that had breakdowns and I thought they were just weak. So when I heard that, I didn't tell Michael that that's what I heard them say. I was embarrassed to say that. I had another friend, Rebecca Kalinda. She called me and said, Jess, I love you, but this is not your heart. You're having a breakdown. You're having a nervous breakdown right now. And I said, don't say that. She goes, it is. And that's what it was. I checked out, I, they sent me home. It, I had a full on nervous breakdown, full on. So we called everybody. We called all our amazing friends and man, we are so blessed to get to rub shoulders with, in my opinion, some of the greatest men and women of God in this hour. We called them all. I had everybody pray for me. Everybody that you can think of pray for me. Nothing changed because if you don't find Jesus, your life is the same. It doesn't matter who you have lay hands on you. If you don't have a face-to-face, -face, if you don't have an encounter with the Lord, if you don't run after Him, you will stay the same. You will stay the same. Todd White prayed for me about five times to sleep at night. He goes, it's your faith. Every time he said, are you sleeping? No, I'm still not sleeping. Your faith is weak. No, my faith wasn't weak. I didn't know Jesus. Of course my faith was weak. I wasn't serving God. I knew Him, but I didn't have an intimate relationship with Him. Of course I'm not sleeping. The busyness of life got the best of me. So we called Pastor Bill. He likes me to call him Bill. We called, him, we called Bill and his response said, how quickly can you get here? Everybody else that we called was so sweet and they prayed for me and it meant so much to me, but only one person said, how quickly can you get here? And we were so desperate at that time Honestly, I, I thought, I didn't know if my marriage would survive. I didn't know if my kids would be okay. I didn't know if I would get locked up in some mental hospital. I was really, when I say, just trust me, I was at my rock bottom. That was really my rock bottom. <laughs> and when I heard that Bill told Michael that, I said, I will do anything. I need a touch from God. I'm desperate for Jesus right now. I will do anything. I'll, let's sell our house. Let's move the kids. Let's put everything on hold. At the time, Jesus' image was growing. And all of our board members and all of our friends said, what are you doing? You can't leave now. You guys have too much going on. You have to be obedient to what God has called you to. And I love my husband because he said, I don't care about all that right now. I need to get Jesse whole. I need to get my wife better. And I love him forever for doing that for me. And I remember our friend, Daniel Kalinda, he called Daniel and said, so many people are telling me not to go, that it's silly that we're doing this, that we're going to lose support. We're going to, our people won't understand. And Daniel goes, bro, what good is momentum if you're driving into a tree? You go get Jesse better. <laughs> Thank you, Daniel. But it's the truth, it was that moment, like I knew in my heart, just like I knew if I didn't go to Columbia when I got invited to go, it was one of those moments again, I've only had two like that, this was another time. I knew in that moment, if I didn't say yes to that, that my life would have stayed the same. I don't know where I would be if we didn't move to Bethel. I honestly don't, I don't know where we'd be. That's, that's the understatement of the century. I don't know where I'd be. So we said, let's go. We put our house on the market, it sold, thank you, Lord. We moved our whole family here and I was desperate for a touch from God. So Bill put us in touch with Jason Valentin. I love Jay, I don't know if he's here, but Lauren is, I love you, Lauren. And I went in broken, thinking there was no hope. Jay walks in and I go, okay, he's a fisherman, I've had like, Dr. Dobbins and like the best in the world talked to me. They did nothing for me. You are like in your flip-flops, sitting crisscross applesauce, asking me about my life. Are you really gonna help me? Like, honestly, he's like, hi, I'm Jay. I'm like, hi, I'm Jessica. I'm about to tell you all my deepest, darkest secrets. Get ready. You're gonna hear some stuff, man. And I thought in my head, I was like, how is, okay, I'll give it a whirl. So we sat there with Jay. And I remember walking into the office feeling so hopeless and like this, 
I don't know if this is gonna work, but it's gotta work. And Jay, in that session, gave us hope that it's gonna be okay. I remember he asked me something that I've never shared, I don't think publicly. He said, close your eyes and I want you to answer me and tell me the first thing that comes to mind when I ask you these questions. I said, okay. So I closed my eyes and he said, what do you think of when you think of ministry? I said, pain, because that's all I knew was pain and ministry. And I was afraid that my kids would have that pain that I had growing up. And it's not because I didn't have a wonderful family. I did, it was just, we didn't know what we were doing and I didn't know what I was doing. It was just a lot fast and I wish we had people in our life then that would have helped us walk that out a little bit better. So I said, pain. And he goes, what do you think people think when they look at you? I said, I think if they knew the real me, they'd be really surprised and disappointed. And he goes, how do you see yourself? I said, worthless. And when I said worthless, I started to cry. And I think Michael started to cry. And I was like, oh, oh, whoa. And I knew that that's what I felt because it was the first thing that came out of my mouth was I felt worthless, not good enough. I've never, before that moment, I never felt like I measured up. I always felt like I had to be something that I didn't feel like I was able to be. I always lived in the shadow of somebody. <laughs> it was my dad and then it became Michael Koulianos' wife. And I was like, oh no, this is never gonna leave my life. But that's okay now, because now I know who I am in Jesus. So it doesn't, and now I'm honored to say that they're my family. It doesn't bother me at all. But at the time, I didn't know who I was. I didn't know my value. I didn't know my purpose in life. I didn't know. I was just lost and so desperate for a savior. So after leaving that meeting, me and Michael looked at each other and we said, you know what, we'll be okay. We'll get through this. There's hope. We're not gonna end in a bad situation. Our kids are gonna be okay. There's hope, there's hope. But I wanna tell you this, this is so important that you get this. I'm all about counseling and talking to people. I think it's beautiful. I like to explain it as a way, like that's a way to shine light on the issues. It brought things to the surface that I didn't know were there. I got to talk about things that I never told a soul. I, I talked about things from childhood on. I got to get to the root, but the, the cure is Jesus, okay? The cure is Jesus. Because you can go to counseling all day and you can get as many sozos as your heart can handle. But if you don't find Jesus Christ, if you don't find Jesus, the one who sets everybody free, you will not leave changed. You will not leave changed. And Beth will be the first people to tell you that. You won't leave changed, you'll leave the same. You'll still be bound. Those chains that held your hands will still hold them. You will not leave different. So in that season, it was so beautiful because it was a time where I could just be with Jesus. So I would go, we had a house on the west side of town here and I would go drop the kids at BCS and I would go home and I would just pray. I would sit in my room, I would close the door and I would just pray and talk to Jesus. And the thing that got me so much that still messes me up inside is how available he was, how near he was. He didn't throw my issues in my face. He didn't throw my shame in my face. He didn't throw all my shortcomings in my face. He was there just wanting me, wanting me, dirty me, messy me with all of my issues. He loved me. And so I started to pray and man, I had such beautiful encounters during those months. I will never forget them. But I tell you what, I cannot live without Jesus. I cannot live a day without Jesus. And I mean that with all my heart. See, we get so used to living this life every day and we forget how near and how available He is. Do you know, He waits for us. He longs to be with His children. He loves us that much. When I got married, the night before I got married, I remember waking up in the middle of the night and my dad was sitting over my bed, just watching me sleep. <laughs> and it startled me a little bit because I was like, whoa, okay. But he knew it was gonna be my last night in the home and he just wanted to watch his firstborn sleep like a daddy would. And I remember waking up and I said, daddy, what are you doing in here? <laughs> and he was, <laughs> maybe he's done that more than I know. I don't know, but that's the first time I saw him doing it. So what are you doing, dad? He goes, oh, teary-eyed. I just wanted to watch you sleep. 
I just wanted to watch you. And that touched me. And it's something that I think about still and it makes me cry because I thought, what a loving father, what a beautiful dad to sit and watch me sleep. But Jesus does that too. And if it moves your heart, if your own father does that, how much more should it move it if your heavenly father does that? Because he is our father and he loves us and he waits for us. He waits for us and how often we don't turn our affection towards him. We get busy with all the stuff, all the stuff. And the busier you get in life or maybe the more successful you get in life or the more growth or whatever you wanna call it you have in life, let me tell you, the more you should become like a child, the more you should go after Jesus, the more you should give him your everything, your everything. He loves to be loved. He loves his children. He's so available, it will mess you up. It will mess, it should mess you up. Like I can have you whenever I want, the King of Kings. I can go and talk to the King of Kings whenever I want. You love me, you want me, you wanna be with me, you wanna touch me. You love it when I sing to you, you love it when I pray to you, you love it when I talk to you. Oh Jesus, you're so beautiful, I just want you. I just want you, you're my everything. And see, I knew that language, but I didn't have that encounter for my life. You can talk the talk, but if you don't live it, your life is dry. It's dry. Like I said, all my friends talked that talk, but it was real. It was genuine. And now for the first time in my life, I was actually having an intimate relationship with Jesus. He was my everything. And I'll tell you what, I don't even know how it happened. People ask, when did you get set free? I'm like, I don't know. All I know is I found Jesus and everything else went away. I can't tell you the time. I can't tell you the night. I can't tell you the hour. All I know is I started sleeping again like a baby, like a baby. Michael can tell you, I'm, as soon as my head hits that pillow, I'm gone and don't even bother me until the morning time. That wasn't happening for me. The fear went away severe fear. I was always afraid someone close to me, I was gonna lose them, always. I was so afraid of everything, that's gone. The anxiety, gone. The depression, gone. Self-hatred, gone. All of that, gone. Fear of man, gone. All of it gone in the blood of Jesus Christ. It covered it all, it's all gone. It's all gone. See, it's, it's so simple that it baffles your mind. It's so simple. And people come to me all the time, how did you do it? I don't know how I did it. I just found Jesus. I found Jesus and he became my everything. He became the reason I woke up in the morning. He became the reason I live. He's everything to me. I found him and in him there's freedom. Who the sun sets free is free indeed. Where the spirit of the Lord is there is freedom. That's my safety. And I'm very aware if I leave that, I'll go back to those chains again. I'll become bound again. No one is exempt from walking into sin. No one is. It's a life outside of Jesus that causes those things to happen. Nobody's exempt from having a breakdown. It doesn't matter if you're up here. You can have all of those issues too. We all need Jesus. We all need Jesus. I wanna read some stuff to you. I, I, one thing I wanted to say, I remember, this was so cool for me. I went to my first Zozo ever and I was like, oh, this is, I don't know what to expect. This is neat, but I was so nervous. And I told this amazing woman, it was just down the road here. I told her my story and I was crying. And she looked at me and said, isn't this amazing? And I said, what? <laughs> amazing. Did you hear what I just told you? She goes, it stops with you. You're fighting so that your children don't have to go through the things that you went through. It stops with you. And in just one moment, it can start with you. Now my daughter will never have to have a breakdown. All the women in my family had nervous breakdowns from generations past. My daughter won't have to, I, that stopped with Jess. I fought, I took that moment. You have to take that moment. You have to grab that moment. 
You cannot let it pass you by. And I don't think we're all here by accident. I think God is setting you up. God is setting you up. This is your moment. You're here just like I was here three years ago. This was in 2016 that I was here. Never in my wildest dreams did I think I'd be right here, right now. I mean, it's just like mind blowing, full circle. God's redemption is amazing. But I knew my moment and I wasn't letting it pass me by for nothing in the world. I was gonna find Jesus with all that it was, no matter what I had to do, I just had to have Him. I had to have Him and this is your moment. This is your moment, that's why I'm here today. I'm not here just to give you a beautiful speech and make you feel warm and fuzzy inside. I'm here to tell you, this is your moment. Grab it by force and grab it by faith and take it and don't you dare let go of it. But find Jesus, find Jesus. He's so available, so beautiful. I'm gonna read to you Luke chapter four. I'm gonna start at verse 14 through verse 20. You can read along with me or not. Then Jesus returned to Galilee filled with the Holy Spirit's power. Reports about him spread quickly through the whole region. He taught regularly in the synagogues and was praised by everyone. But listen to this. When he came to the village of Nazareth, his childhood home, he went as usual to the synagogues on the Sabbath and stood up to read the scriptures. The scroll of Isaiah, the prophet was handed to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where this was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim the captives will be released and that the blind will see and that the oppressed will be set free. And that time of the Lord's favor has come. He rolled up the scroll and handed it back to the attendant and sat down. All eyes looked at him intently. So basically this is what Jesus is saying, like it's me. What the scripture talks about, here I am. Everything you need is found in me. That's what Jesus is saying here. What you read about in Isaiah, it's right here in front of you. It's talking about me. He was with the religious, he was in the synagogues, but they didn't see that. They treated it as common. They knew him as, as Joseph and Mary's boy. So they didn't see that the savior of the universe, the person that came to take all their issues away was standing right in front of them, but they were too blind to see. And that's what God is saying now, like here I am. Do you want me? Are you thirsty? I'll give you living water. Are you hungry? I'll give you bread from heaven. What do you need? It's all found right here. Here I am. I'm right in front of you. But they didn't see that. So then we see in verse 20. This is the part. I'm sorry, not verse 20. Let me find my, here we go. I'll just say it. I'm all over the place now, I'm feeling it. Um, the part that got me is he offended the religious. He made them upset so much so that they tried to push him off the cliff. And then the Bible says that he just walked on by. He just walked right through and kept going his way. And that's the part that messed me up. I'm like, he was so near. All they had to do was touch him. All they had to do was just barely reach out and they could have touched Jesus. They could have touched their healer, their redeemer, but they didn't see him. Their eyes were blind, they couldn't see. Their ears were closed so they couldn't hear. But all they had to do was go like this. They didn't see, he just walked away. See, he's in the whisper. He's in the whisper. Like Elijah, was he in the, the earthquake? No. Was he in the fire? No. He heard God in the whisper. Well, if you hear someone whisper, what do you have to do? You have to be really close to them. You have to be near. He's in the whisper. So he just walked away. And they never had the person to set them free. They never found Jesus. Or you can be like the woman with the issue of blood that is like, I don't care what it takes. I don't care how low I have to go. I don't care how desperate I am. I don't care of the shame and the embarrassment that I'm unclean. Whatever I have to do, I have to touch Jesus. I have to be with Jesus. I have to have Jesus no matter what, no matter the cost, no matter the cost, no matter the price, I just need Him. She got her touched, healed in a moment, in a moment. So today, that's what I ask you, who are you gonna be like, the religious? I feel like this is my opinion. There's one kind of person, for me personally, it's really hard to minister to. 
that know-it-all, been there, done that mindset, that I've seen that before. Oh, I've seen that before. If we're not acting like children, you need to go back to the beginning. You need to go back to the basics. You need to go back to your first love. You need to go back to where you started. My dad tells this story that when he would go to Catherine Kuhlman meetings, she would sit there and talk about her childhood all the time. And he said it would sound almost boring because they were the same stories. And what is she doing? Why is she talking about these stories that she talks about all the time? And then he found out after she had gone to be with the Lord, years later, he asked a staff member, why did she always talk about her childhood stories? And they said, oh, she was going back to the beginning. She was going back to when she first met Jesus. She wanted to remember the beginning. See, it's when we complicate things that life gets hard. He's so simple. Just go back to the beginning. Go back to what stirred your heart years ago. Sing the songs that moved your heart then. They'll still move your heart now. He's not looking for professional Christians. He's looking for the ones that will say, I am lost and I need a savior. I don't have this all figured out. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm desperate for you. I'm lost without you. I, I mean, I, I don't wanna do this on my best day. I'm not a professional speaker. I don't ever wanna be. I just want Jesus. I just want Him. I wanna walk off this stage today and say, Lord, were you happy? Did I touch your heart, God? Did I minister to you today? Did I do what you called me to do? Was I leaning into you, God? If you wake me up at night to pray, will I listen? When you knock at the door of my heart, will I open it? Will I be there? You've been there for me. He's looking for that again. Go back to the beginning, go back to the basics, go back to your first love. I wanna read another passage to you. Thank you, Jesus. Just prepare your hearts even now where God wants to touch you. He wants to encounter his people and he wants to set you free today. You do not have to live in those chains anymore. You don't have to live bound. You don't have to live a life outside of the presence of Jesus. There's no other place to live. There's no better place to live. John verse six, we're gonna go chapter six, verse 26. This is what Jesus is looking for. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. You want to be with me because I fed you, not because you understood the miraculous signs, but don't be so concerned about perishable things like food. Spend your energy seeking the eternal life that the Son of Man can give you. For God the Father has given me the seal of his approval. Verse 28, they replied, we want to perform God's works too. What should we do? Jesus told them, this is the only work God wants from you. Believe in the one he has sent. See, it's not about what he can do through you. It's about him. It's not about the stuff. It's not about the stuff. He'll do the stuff because he's amazing. He'll do the stuff because he's a loving father. He'll touch his people, he'll provide. He's amazing, but it's not about that. It's about him. It's just about Jesus. Verse 32, Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Moses didn't give you the bread from heaven, my father did. And now he offers you the true bread from heaven. The true bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, give us that bread every day. Listen to this part. Verse 35, Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Everything is found in him. It's so simple that it sounds like it's too good to be true. Everything is found in Jesus. Every answer to your issues is found in him. But he wants to be loved. He wants to be loved. He loves like any father loves to hear their children say, I love you. See, we've made it about the stuff. He just fed 5,000 here. And he's saying like, hey, don't love me because of the stuff I can do. Love me for me. Love me for me. Not what I can do for you, but just love me. 
So yeah, Lord, we turn our gaze upon you, Jesus. We turn our affection to you, Lord. We thank you, God, for never giving up on us, never turning your back on us, God, for being so near when we didn't deserve it. Court, I'll minister with your instrument. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you, God, for your goodness. Listen, you can just treat this like any other day, or you can position your heart right now to say, I'm gonna have Jesus. Maybe you've grown cold. Maybe you don't go after him like you used to. Maybe you're like me, how I was three years ago here, hopeless and desperate, just wanting to find a savior, just wanting to feel loved and accepted. And I'm telling you, you can have him. You can have him. He loves you. He loves you, everything you've done, all your sins. If you go and repent of your sins, say you have to make a public confession, but whatever you do is under the blood of Jesus. It's under the blood of Jesus. The Bible says he drives it away, like it's forgotten. It's not even remembered. Once you repent and turn your heart towards him, it's gone. Just come to Jesus. Like a little child, come to Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus, for your love. Thank you, Jesus, for the cross. Thank you, God, for your blood, Jesus, your beautiful blood, Jesus, that poured out for us, God, that washed us, that set us free. Thank you so much, Jesus, for never turning your back on us, God. When everybody else did, you never did, God. You've always been there. You're so faithful. You're so beautiful, Jesus. If that's you, I want you to, I don't know if you can come down here, but if you say, Jess, I've grown cold. Yeah, stand up, just come down to the altar. If you go, I've grown cold. My heart is hard. I want Jesus like you're talking about. I wanna know him like you're talking about. I want to encounter the King of Kings. I wanna lay it all down. See, the Bible says you cast your burdens upon him for he cares for you. Do you know what that means to cast your burdens? It means to literally lay them at the feet of Jesus. Like they're not mine anymore. It's yours, God, you take it. Yeah, and if you're in your seats, just start to pray, pray. Just pray, intercede right now. Don't be a spectator. God is gonna set people free today. Lord, we thank you. We thank you, Jesus. We lay our burdens at your feet, God. We give you our life, Jesus. Oh, Holy Spirit, put a hunger in our heart again, God. Make us hungry again. Make us hungry again for Jesus. Oh, Jesus, we love you, God. Oh, Jesus, we give you our pain, God. We give you our disappointment. We give you our struggles, God. We give you our anxiety, God, our fear, our doubt, Lord. Oh, Jesus, we give you our depression. We give you our thoughts, Lord. I ask that you'll renew our mind today in Jesus' name. Touch our mind, Jesus. Renew our minds today, God. Soften our hearts, God. Just break those walls, God, that we placed around our heart, God. Thank you, Jesus. We wanna let you in. Holy Spirit, we love you. We love you, Jesus. Just love Jesus. Don't, don't even look at me. Just tell the Lord how much you love him. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. I need you more. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, thank you, Lord. Jesus. Jesus, thank you, Lord. Jesus. All the words to say, I need you more. Jesus. Than ever Jesus. before, I need Jesus. you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I need you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I need you more. Thank you, Jesus. More than yesterday.
and just honor his heart right now. Ah, we give you praise. We exalt you, Lord. There's something about being present in this moment. Let's not let it pass. Let's be present and give you all the praise right now, fully present. We're not on our phones. We're not watching Netflix. We're not watching anything else, Lord, but we're fully present to you. And I thank you for the gift of being present. Yeah, I thank you for the gift in many of you right now that the Lord's allowing you to step into something new and it's being present, the ability to be present. That you, you don't want to hide anymore. That's actually a gift that you don't want to. I thank you, Lord, that you're changing our desires. So I bless your ability to be present right now. Lord, and let's just take this moment and let's sing that song one more time, being fully present, and it's a gift right now. Oh, I am so- 